Hello and welcome to The Vital Blend. My name is Anthony Vita. So glad you could join me for this episode because today I'm gonna to be introducing you to Chef AJ. And what's amazing about her story is how she was able to pull through some really dark times to become the wonderful, cheerful, sweet soul that you are about to meet. You see, AJ was overweight by the age of five obese by 11, anorexic in her teens, bulimic in her 20s, addicted to prescription diet pills in her 30s, and in her 40s and early 50s, she was still an overweight food addict. And at her lowest point, she almost ended it all. AJ, even though she was vegan since 1977, still battled with emotional eating and could never get her weight down to where she wanted until she learned the concept of calorie density, which completely changed everything. After 50 years of battling with emotional eating and food addiction and obesity, AJ had finally found the true secret to ultimate weight loss. And for the last 10 or so years, she's been happy, healthy, and trim. In other words, Chef AJ is a true survivor, and there's a lot that we can learn from her, and that's great because she always loves to share. So right now, let's meet Chef AJ. Chef AJ, welcome to The Vital Blend. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you for inviting me. You know, anytime that I feature you on my Facebook page, people always come out and say, I love Chef AJ. And, uh, you know, why not? <laughs> That's so nice. Thank you. Um, the way that I see it, the last 10 or so years of your life, you've made it a point to kind of keep things very simple when it comes to food. Whereas let's say the first 50 years were anything but simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, would it be fair to say that what alcohol would be to an alcoholic processed food was your drug and was a major problem that really went into all these different areas. Can you kind of get into? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all processed food because I was already vegan. So it wasn't like I was, you know, needing Cheez-Its or things like that, or even Doritos. It was really sugar, flour, and caffeine or foods made from those ingredients. Wow. And so this goes back because I, I, you, you had said that you were overweight at the age of five. Like this was yeah. something that you. I remember, you know, I don't have many memories before five, but at five, I was already fat. I mean, like, you know, you could say overweight, but I was fat. I was the fat kid in kindergarten, first grade, uh, second grade. I was having one of those grades I skipped. I skipped fourth grade, but really. It wasn't until I went to college at the University of Pennsylvania, in, which was in the late 70s, that I started seeing oh, a couple of people look like me. There are a couple of people are overweight. You know, it was just it, and then the 80s, you know, it, it, things, obesity rates really started to explode. You know, and, and I think about it's funny because I'm decluttering now. And in grammar school, you, we used to get these black and white photos. They were really long. It would be like the whole class, 40 people and the, and the teacher. And, you know, first grade, second grade, and you can look and, and like, I'm the only fat kid in, in the, you know, it, I was fat before fat was acceptable. It was in the 60s, you know? I mean, I, I don't mean to put people down. I, I know a lot of people are triggered by the word fat, but whatever you want to call it, th there weren't that many people with excess body weight in the 60s. Right. Right. Well, even when I was growing up in the 70s and in the 80s, it was like you had one or two fat friends, maybe. Uh, but a lot of people, especially I'll see people will put up a picture of the beach in 1970 and everybody is trim. <laughs> you know, it's very, very different. Yes. Have you ever watched movies like on Turner Classic Movies and even the extras, you know, in the background dancing, people were not overweight. Once in a while, you'd have a character actor like in Guys and Dolls. I think his name was Stubby K. There'd be like one or or the uh, in uh, Gone with the Wind. There'd be like one overweight character actor. But for the most part, and that you could say, what well, was the entertainment industry? Well, maybe, but also it was it, it just people were not overweight or, or very much back then. Right, right. So when did it become a problem for you? Was it when you tried to get the weight off that you that you just could not figure out how to get it done? Wow. So, you know, it, I think it was always a problem, at least emotionally, because it's, you know, especially I think when you're female, it's, it's you know, it, unfortunately, we're when you're female that your looks are important to your to your future, you know, if you want to get invited to the prom, which I didn't or get married, which I, you know, I did, thankfully. So I think, I think, uh, I think it's just the way it is that people do judge us on our looks, because that's, that's 
That's our currency as females. I'm not saying that it should be that way, but it is. Let's just live in the real world, people. Whereas men, you can be very overweight, but you have other things that are more attractive to women, like your position, your job, your wealth, you know, even so, so being overweight as a female, I think is very hard. And I think it was always a problem that way, but it really didn't become a problem until my health started deteriorating at the age of 43. So I had been vegan already 26 years by then, and I was close to 200 pounds. And I didn't have any of the markers that a lot of people have, like, you know, high cholesterol or high triglycerides or, or those kind of things or high blood pressure, you know, because I had, a, 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 I was vegan for a long time. But what I did develop was precancerous polyps in my sigmoid colon. And that is because I didn't eat food. I ate, I ate junk food for the most part for the 26 years I was vegan. And I had Coke Slurpees for breakfast. I mean, I think about it now and I think, where was the... Where was the food police? Like, why wasn't somebody telling me, like, it's not normal for a 43-year-old woman to go to 7-Eleven first thing in the morning to get her fix of a 27-ounce, I think it was 27-ounces, Coke Slurpee. If that wasn't enough sugar and caffeine, they had these little uh, bottles for the coffee to flavor the coffee. And then I would put exactly eight pumps of vanilla syrup. I mean, when I think about it today, I, I wonder if it would kill me. Like, I can't imagine how, I, I sometimes want to taste it just to, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to get addicted again because I'm sure the sickly taste and the chemical taste, but, but I mean, I, that is so sweet. I mean, it's sugar and caffeine. And then I would go back to 7-Eleven for the, the next fix, which would be Dr. Pepper, regular Dr. Pepper. And when I went to the Optimum Health Institute, because when I had these polyps diagnosed, they couldn't remove them during the procedure that they normally would remove them because my colon, they said was too dirty and they would risk, I would risk getting an infection. So they told me I had to come back and have like real surgery, not like the kind where like they cut open and stuff. And I'm like, uh, uh I'm too afraid. Cause I, I, at the age of 19, I, I developed an allergic reaction direct to, to an, a, to a general anesthetic. And I ended up being like resuscitated and in the hospital wow. for months. And I'm like, I'm not having surgery again, unless it's literally like literally to save my life. And I can't sign the consent form. And so on July 6, 2003, I checked into this wonderful place in Lemon Grove, California called the Optimum Health Institute. And I remember that I took the train from Los Angeles to San Diego and before the cab driver <clears throat> dropped me off, yeah, he took me to 7-Eleven. I had a Coke Slurpee in one hand and a Dr. Pepper in the other hand because I had a friend that said, if they catch you with any contraband, you get kicked out and you don't get your money back. And I'm a pretty cheap person and I didn't want to do that. So I had that, this was the last day I had, you know, white sugar was July 6, 2003. And I went to the Optimum Health Institute. And that's where I learned that your food choices can have a profound effect on your health, how you look, how you feel, what diseases you ultimately acquire and what diseases you can reverse. Because even though I had been vegan for ethical reasons for 26 years, I wasn't eating any fruits and vegetables. That's really pathetic, but it's the truth. My husband said that my wife is the only vegetarian that doesn't eat fruits and vegetables. She thinks Skittles are a fruit. And so it really wasn't until I developed health consequences that I really started paying attention to what I ate. And, and even then, when I cleaned up my diet and reversed my precancerous polyps, the weight still, the weight loss still eluded me until January of 2011, when I went to the True North Health Center as a patient, and I really like learned what I teach today, which is basically calorie density. That's really the secret to ultimate weight loss in two words, calorie density. And people don't understand that term always. They think about, oh, you have to count calories. No, that's the best thing about calorie density is you don't have to count calories, carbs, points, weigh or measure your food on a plate. You just have to understand this, the principles of calorie density that Dr. Barbara Rolls at Penn State has done her life's research on. And then once Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle explained it to me, and of course, Dr. McDougall had talked about it too, but it, it, was, it was helpful being in an in-person setting where it can really materialize for me. And then you know, the weight loss happened is over 10 years ago, and I haven't struggled since. I am so grateful. Let me tell you. So when you learned about calorie density, how much did you weigh at that particular time? So I weighed, I weighed almost 50 pounds more than I weigh now. I weighed 165. I'm about 117 now. So. so you had 50 pounds that you wanted to get off that you felt like you probably were just destined, right? That that was going to stay with you because you had been vegan and you had started to eat a whole lot better, but those 50 pounds were just. I never thought it was going to be 50 pounds. 
And because, you know what, I remember at one point when I, um, when I was on FenFen in my thirties, I got down to 135 and I looked and felt great. So I, I didn't need, I didn't necessarily want or need to be this thin. It just happened because the, the scale and the calendar did the magic once I understood what food to eat. Also, because I was doing this mainly because I wanted to avoid knee surgery, because when I was 50 years old, or right before my 50th birthday, I had a slip and fall in an office building. Somebody mopped the floor and didn't put the sign up. And I really broke my knee very badly. And I was 50 pounds heavier and I couldn't use crutches. I just, I physically could not lug those, my body around and I couldn't use a walker. And so guess what my options were? A wheelchair. And that was pretty humiliating because I couldn't take care of my own, you know, toileting needs and bathing. And I had my, it was just, I, and I'm like, because I was too fat. And I thought, this is, this is it. I've got to do something about this. And so I was really, and because I have such a bad knee and I'm so afraid to have knee surgery, being a little bit leaner than I, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you're too skinny. You don't look good. You know, you should gain 10 pounds. And, and, and I would look fine at 127. I have pictures of it, but for my knee, I need to be the, my, this isn't doing what my doctor said. He goes, you are perfect where you are for, for, you know, because every pound you're overweight, people don't realize is like five pounds additional pressure to your joints. And so that's why with, with what I have, and I, my, my goal is to outlive any medical condition I have. Like I was just diagnosed with a very brand new cataract and I'm just trying to outlive my knee surgery, my cataract surgery. That's my goal in life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the magic sauce then that you found out about that budged those 50 pounds? Yeah. Swapping out the high fat plant foods, which are very healthy, like nuts, seeds, and avocado for calorically dilute plant foods like vegetables, fruits, and yes, even potatoes and sweet potatoes. It was really just making those swaps because people don't realize that people are different in how much fat they can eat and be at a certain body weight. And they're, you know, like you see these wonderful plant-based doctors that have never been overweight that are telling people just eat nuts and seeds. You know, I eat four ounces a day and look at me and they're male and they haven't been overweight. But, you know, I, I, I do it for four years now. I've been running a summit. I've been hosting the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And what I've learned from these experts are that people that are overweight or that have been overweight, we're genetically different than somebody that's never been overweight. And we can't always eat the same way as somebody that's always been lean. As a matter of fact, there's something, let me get the word straight. I believe it's called, is it the metabolic disadvantage? There, there, there's something that and I learned about this from a few of the speakers like Dr. Rosan Alvira, that if you have a, a woman that's say five, five and 125 pounds, and that's a good weight for her. And she's always been that weight. She can eat a certain amount of calories to maintain her weight. But let's say you have a woman that was five, five and 175 pounds, and she lost 50 pounds. And now she's five, five, 125, like this other woman that's never been overweight. She needs something like 500 calories less than a person. It's like, it's called the calorie penalty. It's like you're penalized. And so when you understand calorie density, fat is the most calorically dense macronutrient. It's nine calories per gram, as opposed to four calories per gram for protein and carbohydrate. And so if you want to be able to eat more and weigh less, which is what I did understanding these principles, it, it, for me, just that was a game changer because even when I was eating a very small measured amount of nuts a day, like an ounce, my, the scale wouldn't budge. And I think that people in, our, especially in the plant-based community, don't acknowledge that people, that there's some biodiversity and that people are different. And that even though this person or this doctor can eat a lot of fat and be lean, that is not true for everyone. So that was the biggest thing for me. And then of course, getting over my fear of carbs, like potatoes and rice, I can eat tons of those now. I mean, it, it's so fun. It's like every day is Christmas because, you know, after we're done here, I'm going to eat lunch and I know what I'm having. I have the same thing every day. And it's like a trough and it's delicious. And I, 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 I don't like eating small amounts of food. I like, I, I need a big volume of food to feel full and I'm never going to feel full on nuts, seeds, and avocado unless I eat an unthinkable amount. But when I put fruits and vegetables and starches like potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice in my tummy, I can feel full with eat, with eating a, a very you know normal or adequate amount of calories and not overeating and it's just it's 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 like the best thing ever. <laughs> I love it so much. Right now, what do you say about the fact people say, "Well, eating a potato would shoot my insulin up"? 
Yeah, it probably will. But see, if you're diabetic, but here's the thing, when you eat the way that I recommend, especially if you're working with one of the plant-based doctors or a group like Mastering Diabetes, and they teach you how to do it healthfully, the whole purpose to eat is to raise your blood sugar. That is why we eat. Right. And so you need to, you, you you can't just go from what you're eating, especially if you're diabetic, to just eat plain white potatoes. But But I don't eat just plain white potatoes. You know, people worry about the glycemic index. But what's more important is the glycemic impact or the glycemic load, unless you're doing mono eating. So if I'm eating potatoes, which I'm going to have for lunch, I'm eating a ton of vegetables with it or beans or something like that. So it's not just the impact from that one food. And I would encourage anybody that worries about eating potatoes to just watch all the interviews I've done with Dr. McDougal. He's actually done two webinars with me about potatoes specifically. So, so you want to balance that with some other things like maybe have some beans with your potatoes and some greens, but don't just eat potatoes by yourself but that the whole point of eating is to raise your blood sugar but of course we know when the blood sugar is raised more quickly insulin is raised more quickly but a whole food plant-based diet especially the way i eat and recommend without the addition of sugar oil and salt that can if it's type 2 diabetes not type 1 it can ultimately reverse it so that you will be able to include greater and greater amounts of these complex unrefined carbohydrates and i would think that if you're eating a potato with butter, oil, and cheese, you will store that fat very easily. Yeah, right. that's the thing. You're absolutely right. I'm trying to remember which video Dr. Michael Clapper did. And he talked about like, if you're going to eat fat, at least as a person that's whole food plant-based, then you want to include it like in your leafy green meal. You don't want to include it in your carbohydrate meal. So the you don't want to eat them together. And if you do eat them both, that's if you want to lose weight. Somebody like my thin husband, he can have, you know, peanut sauce on his noodles or on his sweet potatoes. But for those that struggle with weight, you don't want to have carbs and fat at the same meal. Right, right. That's yeah. what I was kind of getting at. That's yeah. That, that's why the whole keto thing does, does not work because I saw somebody put up a photo of a, a cheeseburger and they were all happy about the bun not having any carbs in it, which is like, to me, it seems like, it's, it's like we're in a clown world, but this is, this is how people eat. It's crazy. Just if, if, I mean, let's say I was on a desert, I, well, I wouldn't probably have a cheeseburger on a desert island. I, the bun is the only thing of the cheeseburger I would eat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or the lettuce and tomato. Yeah. So while we're talking about having a potato, when I tell people, all right, no butter, no oil, no, they say, well, what am I going to eat it with? Because it's just a plain potato. I mean, how can we, because you're a chef, how can, oh, God. Oh, how can we make it taste, all, taste good? Well, let me tell you, well, you know, everybody's individual, what they like, but my favorite condiment has always been barbecue sauce, not ketchup, not mustard, but barbecue sauce. So I take my potatoes and I put them in a machine called an air fryer where I don't need to add oil or salt and they are crispy and I dip them into barbecue sauce. That's one way I do it. Uh, we love to make stuffed potatoes, either potatoes or sweet potatoes. And, and actually we had company last night and I have this thing called a lazy Susan and people fill their potatoes with things like roasted, fire roasted corn and kidney beans or black beans or pinto beans and pico de gallo salsa and cilantro and jalapeno peppers if they want it a little bit spicy and guacamole, either full fat guacamole or guacamole that's made out of peas. And you make this delicious dish, dish uh, and out of potatoes. It's, it's so, it's yummy, you know? Uh, people, you know, fat is very addictive and that's why people like it, you know, it, it, because here's one thing about caloric density. We have a, a neurotransmitter that's produced in the brain whenever we have a pleasurable experience like sex or food, and it's called dopamine. And the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. So people love, you know, high fat, high calorie food because they get more dopamine. Dr. Goldhammer talks about how sugar, oil, and salt aren't foods. They're chemicals people add to the food that fool the brain's satiety mechanisms. And so that's why people have this love affair with butter and cheese and oil because of the high fat, high caloric density, more dopamine, that kind of thing. But as far as taste is concerned, there's so many things you can put on potatoes to make. I mean, ketchup is, is great, for example. And you can, I, I make ketchup myself without sugar or salt. I make my own barbecue sauce. It's very easy to make. I use just two ingredients to make it. Um, it's with sweet potato fries, though. I actually like mustard better. That's the one. That's the one time mustard wins is when I'm having sweet potato fries. Right, right. That's really good. And like, what about with a salad? 
what what can we put onto a salad that would make it taste good? Because I was just talking to someone who said that they eat it plain and I kind of got the feeling it really wasn't going over well. And so what are some things that we can make? Because going out into the uh, supermarket's not going to work because everything's got, got oils. So Absolutely. what can we make? Yeah, definitely. And making your own dressings is, is actually easier than people would think. You know, two things that people have heard of that, that they could probably even buy in a healthful manner is salsa and hummus. Believe it or not, those make delicious salad dressings. And those are those are two options. I'm saying these especially for people that are out and about. And what can I do? I love vinegar. I love balsamic vinegar. And there are many brands like California balsamic, but it can be it, it, depending on where you live. If you live in a major city, most major cities have stores that sell olive oil and vinegar. They can be called different things. And most vinegar is 6% acidity. And so it's very watery and it's very, uh, very sharp, you know, very sour. And some people like that. Like my husband, he loves regular balsamic vinegar. I never cared for it. But there's a thing called reduced balsamic vinegars and you can reduce vinegar yourself. It's actually very easy. You just take the 6% acidity vinegar and you kind of boil it and you cook it and cook it. And what happens is it, instead of being watery, now it's thick and syrupy and it's 4% acidity. So it's actually sweet and it's not sweet from any added sugar. It's sweet from the grapes that have now been concentrated. Well, these companies have found ways to flavor it, both the white balsamic and the dark. And a lot of the flavors are very sweet and fruity based, which are fine, but I, they're not my favorite, but a lot of them are more savory the flavors like seven herb Italian, dill mustard. And for me, these are delicious straight up salad dressings. Um, I make my own lemon poppy seed dressing. It's like the easiest recipe. I'm, I don't have the exact measurements memorized, but it's basically lemon juice, water, dates, mustard, poppy seeds, and a little bit of chia seeds for thickening. And it's a delicious dressing that I use frequently. I recently started making my own ranch dressing out of potato with a little bit of coconut uh, yogurt, not coconut yogurt, excuse me, unsweetened cashew yogurt and a tiny bit of tahini. I just started adding 10 years after remaining slim, a tiny amount of fat from seeds, tiny, tiny amount. And I seem to be doing okay with it because I'm putting it on huge salads. So it's very possible to make delicious salad dressings. Guacamole is a delicious salad dressings and you can thin you can thin it out a little bit just like you could thin out the hummus so a lot of times if you add interesting things to your salad like fruit like a, like a cut up apple or pear or you know i don't know things that are more wet in nature like beans a lot of times you almost don't need dressing other than a squeeze of lemon or lime but we're we are big fans of vinegar and and that's that's really one of my go-to's so would you stay away from, if, if you're trying to lose weight, would you not put nuts in your salad? And I personally wouldn't. I, yeah. You know what I say to people is you could always do what Dr. Doug Lyle says is run an experiment. You know, if people are, people eat nuts for various reasons. And most reasons I think is because they're delicious. And again, we love these high fat, high calorie foods. You know, we evolved in an environment of scarcity. And what people don't realize, I actually had a nut here. I don't know where it went. When I say a nut, if you've ever seen a nut in nature, it's not like the walnut half that you see shelled, or it's not even the brown shell. Like nuts have like this whole other shell on them that's about this big. And then another big thing, like it's crazy if you ever see a nut in nature, it's not like a nut in Costco, right? And nuts were seasonal for our ancestors. They, they didn't eat them every single day and they certainly didn't eat them roasted or salted. And I think people like them because our brain always finds these high calorie foods as valuable, even though we didn't get them all the time. And now we can get them you know, everywhere, 24 hours a day. And so, so a lot of people say, well, you know, I have to have my omega-3 fatty acids. And it's true, that's an essential fatty acid, but people don't realize nuts aren't the only way to get them. You can get them from seeds like flax seeds or chia seeds, or you can get them from greens. So greens are really high in omega-3 fatty acids, especially one called purslane, which is a, a prevalent in, in most ethnic markets. A lot of people don't eat it, but it's actually quite good. And there's a test called the fatty acid profile where you can actually test your levels of omega-3, omega-6, your DHA, ALA, EPA, the ratio. And it's something that I watch every year because I'm, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to re recommend people do something that's unhealthy. So I always say to people, get your levels tested and see what they are, you know, right now. And you could always do a three week experiment, avoiding the high fat plant foods like nut seeds, avocado, coconut, and olives for three weeks. Because if you have fat on your body, you're not going to become fatty acid deficient 
in three weeks. And Dr. McDougall says he's never heard of a single case of fatty acid deficiency. And, and he even said he talked about one case where I, either somebody was on a feeding tube or a ventilator and they actually rubbed oil on their skin to give them what they needed. So I think people worry so much about deficiencies when the true cause of most disease is excesses. And if people are worried, a tablespoon of flaxseed for most people, ground flaxseed a day is really enough to meet their essential fatty acid. But I tell people to do an experiment and see if, if going without these high fat plant foods for three weeks, if it makes a difference. I've never seen it not make a difference in people's weight if they were trying to lose weight. But again, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable when you go from a higher fat diet to a lower fat diet because of you know, it takes a while for that, that fat receptor to get dialed down. Dr. Esselstyn talks about this a lot in his work because he's telling his heart patients not to have any oil or nuts. And so people can be a little bit uncomfortable when giving up their addictions. And I do think for a lot of people, these high fat plant foods are addictive like in nature, or at least a trigger food for them. And, you know, I always say, if you, you know, if you can't do without it, then maybe it's, it's something to look at for you, you know? Right, right. Because I see so many people struggling with their weight and, you know, trying to find out what they can eat. But I can see that they're eating a lot of these high calories, these, these uh, foods that bring on a lot of cravings. And they're trying to eat these natural garden foods, but yet they still have one foot in the other door. And it's hard to do both. Like you almost have to, you have to get rid of one really to really appreciate the other one. Right. I agree. And that's why I think if, if for most people, cheat days are not a good idea, you're only cheating yourself. And that's why, like when people say, well, I'm going to do this Monday through Friday and then on the weekend, I'm going to go out and drink and do, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to when you're not consistent to, to reach, I think, for most people to reach their health and weight loss goals, because I think consistency is key. And when you have a foot in both worlds, I think you never fully neuro adapt. And what I mean by that is you never really can enjoy either <laughs> because when you're, when you're, when you're, I mean, I'm using this air quotes, when you're being good, I don't like that word, but when you're compliant, when you're following the program, uh, you, you know, then if you have the missing for the other way of eating, then you go to the other way of eating and then you feel guilty for not doing it. But the thing is, is you can learn to really enjoy and appreciate the taste of whole natural food in its more simple form. But if you're always teasing your taste buds and tantalizing your taste buds with high fat, high calorie foods that aren't on your regular plan, it makes the healthy food less enjoyable. So the reason, you know, when, you, when I think about people like Dr. Furman, like we pretty much eat pretty close to the same way, he's never needed to lose weight, but he really enjoys the way he eats. But then if you go out and eat another way, it, it makes your food by comparison, not as exciting, I think is what it is. And so I like my food to be delicious at every meal. So I, that's why I stay, I don't, I don't waver from my program because when I, if I do, I see what happens when other people do and it, it never seems to end well. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and I, I guess oil is one of the biggest things that people have an issue with. And um, the thought of cooking with water or vegetable broth is a, a foreign thing, but What's your advice for somebody who is looking to kick the oil and they're wondering, well, how do I cook with just water? Well, here's the thing. And, you know, whether people go vegan or go plant based or not, oil is, I think, the biggest triumph of marketing over science. It, it's, it's not even a question of whether it's good or bad, because we can argue that whether there's some benefits to it. The first thing I say to people is if there's a benefit in a processed food, wouldn't it have been in the whole food? So what I'm saying is if there is something really that you need in that olive oil or that flaxseed oil, wouldn't it be in the olive or the flaxseed? Right. And so why would anybody, you know, I, I just, I, I, I wrote a book called Unprocessed and my whole point was, is that we are not designed to eat processed food. We are meant to eat our food whole from a plant rather than manufactured in a plant. And so if there's something that's beneficial in the olive oil, wouldn't it have been in the olive? Like what could possibly be done in the processing to now make it beneficial? Right. You know, when you take a whole food, you make it calorie rich and nutrient poor. So I, I don't remember the calorie density of olives. They're either four or 600 calories per pound, but olive oil is 4,000 calories a pound. And when we process it using something called lye, which is very toxic, because I don't know anybody that can make olive oil in their own home. Everything that was beneficial about the olive 
the water, the fiber, the vitamins and the minerals, the phytochemicals, the antioxidants and micronutrients are now thrown away and we're drinking this non-nutritive liquid. For people that really think that olive oil is all that, I really encourage them to watch a video. You can Google this or put it on YouTube by Dr. Nick Delgado, where he talks about how to become diabetic in six hours, where he literally gives himself diabetes just by drinking olive oil. It's a really interesting video. And so the thing is, is there, there, if, if people really feel there's something they need in the olive oil to eat the olives, always eat the whole food. I did an experiment on my husband. I, I wasn't doing it on purpose, but in 2008, when I heard Dr. Esselstyn speak about how oil injures the endothelial cells, it's the vasculature of our circulatory system. And if you want to be heart attack proof, don't eat it. I'm like, you know, he, he sold me prevent and reverse heart disease. We have heart disease in our family. I don't need to eat oil. You know, it doesn't really taste very good. If you've ever just tasted it by itself. Right doesn't taste very good. And, and even at high doses, it can be an emetic. It actually can cause you to vomit. When you use oil, you got to use a lot of salt to make it taste good. But I don't know a lot of people that really just love drinking olive oil straight. So I stopped using oil. And it was August 1st, 2008. And I have a very lean husband. And he, he couldn't tell because the food either tasted the same or even better because olive oil coats the taste buds on your tongue, actually. And I always made his breakfast, sent him to work with lunch and made dinner. And about seven months after stopping oil, we were supposed to go to a formal event on the weekend. And he tried to put his belt on and he couldn't, uh, there was no more loops because we, we didn't have a scale. He goes, oh my God you know, do I have cancer? I lost so much weight. And he, he lost something like 13 pounds. And if somebody that didn't need to lose weight, that didn't want to lose weight, that was being experimented against, against their will could lose that much weight, you know, without knowing, imagine if you stopped oil on purpose, it's 4,000 calories per, a pound. It is the most calorically dense food on the planet. It has no fiber. It has no nutrients. It basically has no satiety. So it can't activate the mechanisms of satiation. It slips under the radar undetected. It's, it's the easiest way, I think, to get people to lose weight, especially if they don't want to give anything up. But the problem is, is if they do restaurant eating, there's, they're never going to not have oil. It's not possible. I worked in a restaurant. Even if they somehow steam your food or prepare it, the, the pot still had oil. The water still had oil and salt. The cookware has oil. And you know what's interesting, and I didn't know this is even when you get the caloric uh, counts, like for restaurant foods that have to do it, that doesn't include the oil they're cooking it in. Oil is 130 calories for one tablespoon, one tablespoon, 14 grams of saturated fat. We have no minimum daily requirement for any kind of saturated fat. For 140 calories, I can have like two pounds of zucchini. I can have almost a pound of fruit. It's, it's I mean, I can have a whole potato. Right. It's just, it's just such a waste of calories. It's like, it's, it's really ridiculous. And it's not really food for humans. Oil is for a car to run. It's not for, we don't need oil. Yes, we need fat. And what the fat we need is the essential fatty acids, which we can get from plants. But to me, it is the most ridiculous thing why anybody thinks they need oil. It doesn't make the food taste better. It just increases the caloric density. I don't know. I, it, to me, it's a mystery why anybody would still use it once they understand it's expensive. It's not cheap. You know, I've worked with restaurants when I worked in, lived in LA to get the oil out of the food. And when they did, nobody noticed. I mean, they didn't take it out of everything on the menu, but they took it out of all their salad dressings, out of their soups. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. They read the China study and they wanted to make healthier options. Nobody knew. And the chefs at first kind of balked it because they, they're taught at culinary school that, you know, it's the holy grail oil. But then when they realized what they could do without it, they were like, you know, because chefs are also in charge of the budget for the restaurant. And they're like, wow, you're saving so much money. It's so much easier to clean up the dishes. I mean, you know, when you don't have that, I mean, I, I, I used to be a pastry chef and I would see like when, you know, it would, the oil on the, on the, on the, on the cuisine arc, it was just like, it's so hard to clean. I'm thinking like, God, if it's not coming out with the hot water in the dishwasher, what's it doing to my arteries, you know? Exactly. Right. It is amazing how they prop up this processed food with all these benefits. It's like, it's a refined food. You, you took everything out of it. And now you're going to tell me about the benefits. Um, what about when it comes to baking and cooking, like not doing something on a skillet. Now, now we're talking about making breads or making other things. What can totally, we use? Well, totally doable because when you think of it, I'm not hundred percent sure because I haven't baked bread in years, but 
sourdough bread, for example, which is a very popular bread, I don't think there ever was oil in that, like to make that particular kind of bread. And, you know, you can bake without oil very easily. You can use things that have high moisture, like canned pumpkin puree, ripe bananas, applesauce, apple butter, prune butter, tofu. There's just, there's, you cannot tell the difference in a dessert for sure. And, and you know, sauteing, if you get a good piece of cookware, like waterless cookware or a scan pan or a green pan or a ceramic pan or even stainless steel, you can caramelize onions without any water. You just need a little bit of liquid. And it's, I don't know, it's just, it, I think it's, you know, I think it's because that's how people were raised. This is what they're taught and they don't know another way until they learn another way. And then when they learn the other way, they're like, I can't believe I should do it that way, you know? Right. Now, when you were a vegan and not eating right, how was that when you made the switch to actually eating fruits and vegetables? Was that tough? Like all the withdrawal that you must yeah, have felt? I, I mean, was what? miserable. I was miserable for about six days. And that's why, thank goodness, I was in an inpatient setting at the Optimum Health Institute because I don't think if I was at home and having to work, I would have been able to detox or, or get off, get withdraw. And, you know, now there's a place called the True North, well, it was always there. I hadn't heard about it, the True North Health Center, where I could have probably had the same results. But yeah, it was miserable. It was, it's, you know, detox is a bitch, whatever the drug is. And that's how, you know, the worse you feel when you stop a behavior, the more addictive it is, right? Yeah. So, I mean, believe me, I love sweet potatoes. I love them dearly. I eat them every day for lunch. I have for 10 years. And if I couldn't get them for whatever reason, out of season travel, I would feel disappointed and I would miss them, but I don't think I would flip out. You know what I mean? I would right. eat something else. And I'm like, oh, well, no sweet potatoes, darn, you know, too bad. I hope that I get them again. But with sugar, it's not like that. With caffeine, it's not like that. You go through physical withdrawal symptoms. There's emotional ones too, you know, crying and things like that, but you're, it, it's, it's really hard. And, you know, now that we're learning so much more about the microbiome, I'm sure that a lot of the stuff that I was feeling at the time, because I got really bloated and I had stomach aches and, and diarrhea, I'm sure because my microbiome was like, well, well, wait, she's been feeding me this stuff for 43 years. Where is it? What, you know, and now she's given me this, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure if my microbiome could have talked, you know, 20 years ago, they'd be like, what the heck is going on? You know, give me my sugar, give me my caffeine. So it was really hard. But after about six days, because I went in on a Sunday. So, so Sunday had had a survey, Monday, Tuesday, went, yeah, uh, on the seventh day, you know, God rested. And on the seventh day, I, you know, I started coming out of it and, um, it's really hard. And, you know, it's hard emotionally, too, because, you know, I re, you, I, you, you, you rely on these things for, you know, for feeling good, you know, to, to get your hit of dopamine or whatever. And, you know, you have to find other ways to get pleasure in life and, and sweetness in life, you know, so that that's a whole nother story. But the physical withdrawal shouldn't last more than a few days for most people, most people. And what's nice about being in a place like an Optimum Health Institute or True North is your is, is why you're getting rid of all the chemicals and detoxing, they're feeding you the most nutritious foods, you know, plants, green plants, green juices, things like that. That really does help, you know, or, or, or to put the good stuff in. But yeah, and, then, and also food doesn't taste good for a while too. If you're used to a lot of sugar, fat and salt, good luck at first. That's why people go to True North and Water Fast for this process of taste neuroadaptation, because then when they start eating again, you can give them steamed zucchini and they're like, they think they're eating a hot fudge sundae. You know what I mean? Right. So, so yeah. So what does it take about a week or two for your taste buds to get to where they should be? What so, is that like? So for salt, especially people that use a lot of salt or eat processed food, it can take up to 30 days. So people, they, believe it or not, with sugar, fat, and salt, salt can be the hardest for people. And so I'm not as big of a stickler with people if they want to use a little salt on their vegetables, you know, not from processed food. You know, we never stop having a sweet tooth. We have taste buds on the tip of our tongue for sugar and salt. So we're supposed to like these things because they were valuable in nature, but they, but they came from whole sources, right? You know, the, the salt came from the green vegetables and the, the, the sweet came from fruits. And, and we knew they were ripe if they were sweet, if they weren't, they weren't sweet and we weren't meant to eat them. We were never, what a lot, I think what a lot of people don't understand is that we were never meant to activate the pathways of sugar, fat, and salt at the same time. And that's what Dr. Lyle, Dr. Goldhammer called the pleasure trap. If you look in nature, 
with the exception of breast milk, which is only for a short period of time for the infant, there is not a single food in nature that has sugar, fat, and salt in the same package. There's not even one that has sugar and fat or sugar and salt or fat and salt, unless we add it to it, right? And so what happens is that's what processed food is. That's what restaurant food is. It's a hyper palatable combination, high in sugar, fat, and salt. And together it's like all the bells and whistles go off in the brain, the brain, like, you know, avocado is, is a whole natural food and, you know, it tastes pretty good, but most people put salt on it, right. When they're making guacamole. So they're adding, you know, sugar, salt with fat, French fries, salt with fat, you know, uh, desserts are generally sugar with fat, or usually there's usually all three of them. I call that the evil Trinity because usually they're found in conjunction with each other. And when that happens, people can't, they can't stop eating them together. So I would say for most people, you know, it depends on how bad a person's diet was because the longest I saw it take for somebody for the food, this person was the most stubborn client ever and had one of the worst diets. She didn't start liking the food until about the third month. It really took her that long. But I would say for most people, if they're willing to eat healthy foods like fruits and vegetables, I would say the big suffering is just going to be the first week. And then maybe the first month, there's going to be some adjusting, but most people do pretty good after that, you know? Yeah. And then this is why Alan Goldhammer says we live in a world designed to make us fat, sick, and miserable. It's because really the game is stacked against us because companies go out of their way to make us crave what they have to offer. And it's almost like we have to do our own homework because it really is not in our favor. And we can feel like the odd man out trying to order things without oil and trying to not have this salt, sugar, fat constantly, which is the way it is. You're absolutely right. And there was two wonderful books, actually three now written about that. One is called The End of Overeating by Dr. David Kessler, the former head of the FDA when Bill Clinton was president, and two books by Michael Moss, who's an investigative journalist and Pulitzer Prize winning author. One is called Fat, Sugar, and Sugar, Fat, and Salt, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, and one is yeah. called Hooked. And when I read those books, it, I, did, I, wasn't, I was just so mad that they were trying to manipulate my brain chemistry for profit, that it had nothing to do with health or weight. I'm like, I am not putting money in these people's pockets. That's it. They're not getting my money. The F because we, they knew what they were doing. And the thing is, is there's, it is so, you know, when, when I, when you talk to I, one of my uh, favorite doctors, Dr. Frank Sabatino, who's really, I think of an addiction specialist, he talks about how food addiction is the only addiction we can do in broad daylight in front of everybody at our desk at work, at our desk at school, you know, it, you know, if you, if you're a heroin addict or a cocaine addict, or even an alcoholic, I mean, yeah, you can drink in public, but you probably can't really to the degree you can with food, do it in public, but it's actually encouraged, you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> to, to, to do that. And because food is so, um, junk food is so socially acceptable, readily available and easily affordable. And because everybody else is doing it, it, it must be okay. And it's, it, it, it's so people that are trying to be healthy in a word, world designed to make us fat, fat, sick and miserable were considered, you know, there's orthorexic, you're too thin, there's something wrong with you. And it's like, it, it's, it's so funny to me. You know, I, you know, when I think about how, when I was obese and I even used to smoke, I'm so embarrassed to say this was a long time ago. Thank God. Um, I was a respiratory therapist and asthmatic, and that shows how powerful addiction is. It wasn't for too many years, thankfully. I was doing it to try to keep my weight down. And, and nobody said anything to me. If I was eating, you know, McDonald's or smoking, people didn't say a word, but the minute I started getting lean and healthy and eating kale, it's like everybody came out of the cupboard as a nutritionist, you know, like, oh, kale's high in oxalates, you know, you know, beans have lectins. It's like these sound bites are so ridiculous. You know, you gotta be really careful where you get your information from. And I trust the doctors at True North. Right. And what do you see in the value of having somebody help you get through this kind of thing? Because it can be tough doing it alone. I did it by myself and learned what I had to learn. I don't know if, you know, I know that you got help at various points, but for some people, it's just tough when you don't have anybody in your family. Like it's tough trying to, cook, you know, make a healthy salad when you're making a steak for your husband, let's say, or you're always getting called to go out to eat and nobody is really on your side. It can be that, that much tougher, right? Well, exactly. Like imagine if you uh, were an alcoholic and you went into rehab for alcoholism, 
uh, there would be no alcohol there. And I'm pretty sure that they would recommend that wherever you are, there's no alcohol. So if you were a bartender, probably not the best job for you and not to have alcohol in your home. So imagine you now you've detoxed, you're out of rehab and uh, there's alcohol for your house, for friends and family. How successful do you think you're going to be? It's no different with the food. And so it's, it's, it's hard, you know, people have broken up there are marriages and relationships because of this, and they have to just decide what is important to them. I'm not saying the other person needs to change, but I think the other person can't be having those foods in the house anymore. And if you're the one buying them and preparing them, good luck, because I've been saying for 10 years now, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. It's not a question of if you will eat it, just when. You know, you know that these foods aren't healthy, so why would you want to feed them to the people you love the most, your spouse and your family? You know, if they're little addicts just like you, that's okay, but you don't have to be their executioner or their drug dealer. And so what I would say to the individual is that they have to eat those foods outside the house. That's really the only way I see it working long term. Right. And I, I have talked to some who have gotten that handled. They're able to do it. They, they have their own thing where they say, you know what, I like what you were talking about. You see what these foods do to your dishwasher and to your sink. What is it doing to the inside? I'm not even going to touch these foods, you know, but not everybody can actually get through that kind of talk to themselves. Right. You know? I, I think there are some people that can use willpower and can do it and good for them. My only concern is what about the bad day that could happen? You know, the real, I, I see, I see that with people and then, you know, their dog dies or they lose their job or they get in a car accident and all of a sudden, you know, their husband's treat in the freezer that wasn't even their favorite flavor calls to them. I have seen that happen. So I worry about that, but, but good for them if they can withstand an unclean environment. I know I couldn't. I mean, that's been my secret is to just live in a clean environment and have healthy food always ready. Do the best you can, at least separate the food, you know, but don't be the one cooking it. No, especially if they're kids, you, you, you have to, you know, now that you know better, you just got to do better. Right. Um, I want to ask you about cheese because we're talking about foods that have got stimulants that hit the dopamine receptors. Cheese is one of these that actually has stuff in it that will make you addicted. And yeah. that's not so really you, telling it short either. That's cheese and oil, man. When I work with people, it's like, even if you don't want to be vegan, you got to stop the dairy and you got to stop the oil, really. So cheese, there's a whole book written about it by Dr. Neil Barnard called The Cheese Trap. Cheese, dairy is addictive because of this, these casomorphines in it. So people might've heard the word casein, which is the protein in dairy. But when we ingest it in the brain, it becomes like an opiate, casomorphine, caso cheese, morphine. And I remember Howard Lyman, the mad cowboy, the one that was the defendant with Oprah Winfrey in that case a long time ago. I remember him once saying that it was harder for him to quit cheese than it was to quit smoking cigarettes even. So, you know, the casein was in the breast milk in order to or turning into casomorphines in order to lull the infant to sleep. That's why if you see babies nurse, they often fall asleep, not often, almost always fall asleep right afterwards. And so basically cheese is like a drug because the, the, the casein is even more concentrated in things like cheese, yogurt, and ice cream than it is in milk. So yeah, and it's, it's 1600 calories a pound. It's too calorically dense for most people to lose weight and keep it off eating any discernible amount of these high fat, high calorie foods like cheeses and oils. Yeah. And, and kind of like oil, it's in a lot of things. I mean, nowadays you got pizza where it's, it's inside the crust, you know, yes. um, how can we make something at home that has a cheesy type of a flavor that, so that we're not totally out of the Right. Well, so here's the thing. It's never been more doable, but people have to understand what we've been saying all along, that the reason you seek these out is for the pleasure that it gives you in your brain. And I can create the most delicious cheese that looks and tastes just like it using a book by Miyoko Shinner. I can't remember, artisan vegan cheese, but you're not going to get that hit in the brain. And if you're looking for a food for that reason, the most delicious vegan cheeses aren't going to do it at first, at least not necessarily. But the thing that for most recipes gives the cheesy flavor is something called nutritional yeast. And that is just something that plant-based eaters have been using for years to give that umami or cheesy flavor. But Miyoko Shinner, she sells it now. It's uh, it's called Miyoko's Creamery. She it's it's not low calorie food, but it's still way better than having cheese, in my opinion. And you know, cheese has oh, I don't even want to know if I should say this, but 
blood blood pus and feces is in the cow's milk. They, they our country allows so many more parts per million than other countries of blood pus and feces in the milk because you know the cow doesn't get go for a walk. It's 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 just dairy is just scary. It's gross, and if people would really look into how it's made, I don't think they would ever eat it again. Yeah, that's very very true. Very very gross. <laughs> yeah, it, there's nothing grosser and and it's the most inhumane thing in the world imagine having your baby taken away from you you know i mean it's it's just sad it's i mean all animal you know um food production is is sad but but dairy is especially heartbreaking right um i wanted to ask you like if we go out to eat we talked about how difficult it is do you have any tips for somebody who yeah just, a couple they're, of tips they're, they're just getting going and they want to know what can i do when i go out there's a few things. One, eat before. So at least you're not starving. doesn't mean you have to eat your full meal, but at least don't go hungry because then the bread basket, you're going to inhale it. Number two, if the restaurant has, I believe, more than one location, they usually put their nutritional information online or look at their menu online. So, so if you know where you're going, look at the menu beforehand and maybe even make a call to the restaurant during what I call non-peak hours which are generally like between like two and four, you know, after the lunch rush, before the dinner rush, call them up and say, I've heard some wonderful things about your restaurant, but I'm on a very special diet and say these two words, doctor's orders, can you accommodate me? And instead of telling them what you can't have, tell them what you can have. Actually, there's, there's these little cards that Dr. Nate Gershwell gives out, which are really helpful that, that you can hand to them and just say something like, you know, I can have any fruit, vegetable, whole grain, or legume uh, without the, without the addition of, you know, sugar, oil, or salt, or whatever it is, your food plan, can you accommodate me? And they will either tell you that they can, or they can't. If they can, great. If they can't, maybe consider another restaurant. Um, I had one client once for whom, you know, a rest one restaurant meal could be the difference between being in heart failure or not. And so what she did, because she had to entertain clients regularly. Now, this was in Los Angeles and other cities may, may not allow this. But what she did, which I thought was brilliant, is she would bring her food to the restaurant in advance. And she, she, they, she explained the situation to them and then she, they would heat it up, plate it for her and charge her for the lowest price entree. So there, if there's a will, there's a way. You can also get things, for example, not so interesting things, but like a dry salad, sometimes a plain baked potato, and you can have things in your purse or fanny pack that can embellish them and people don't even have to know. Like I, there's this little tiny thing that I have, like a California balsamic makes 1.8 ounce bottles of vinegar. Very discreet. I could have that. Nobody's going to really know or pay attention. The restaurant's still getting their money from the salad. What do they care, right? That I used my own dressing or that maybe I had a sweet potato in my purse or something like that. So, so uh, don't go eat in advance, call in advance, navigate the menu, bring your food or embellish the food that you can get or do the best and bless your rest. Yeah. There, there's some people that'll say, this sounds crazy. Like bring yeah. my own food, eat before I go out. But you have to understand that some people, they need to get this handled because it is wrecking them in some way. I mean, you've, you've probably seen this kind of way of eating wreck people in your own Oh my God. I've family. seen people, I've seen people, you know, lose limbs. I've seen people on the dialysis, you know, on the, on the kidney uh, transplant list. So yeah, I, I can understand that it, it may sound like, um, a lot of effort and it might be outside your comfort zone, but then you just have to ask yourself, you know, you know, what, what do you want? You know, Dr. Goldhammer would answer. He would say, well, how fat and sick do you want to be? So, you know, you do have to sometimes go outside your comfort zone and take extraordinary measures. See, personally, I just don't eat at restaurants because even if I can get a compliant meal, which I don't believe I can, um, I don't want to get sucked back into the pleasure trap and be there, you know, with my plain baked potato and dry salad while somebody else is eating vegan lasagna and vegan hosted. I don't want to be in that environment. Right. And also it's so expensive for yeah. the amount of food that I need to eat to feel full. And it just doesn't taste as good as my food. So that doesn't mean that I'm a hermit or antisocial. I create social connections with people outside of food. We go to yoga together. We go to art classes together, to paint night. We take walks. We do cultural events. We have game nights. We socialize in potlucks or I have them over and make compliant food. There are ways to have meaningful relationships and fun experiences without going to restaurants. When you go to a restaurant, you're going to eat about 500 calories more than you need from fat that your body is not going to even recognize. And, you know, 
they're just, I think of restaurants as a punishment. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about the pandemic is there are people that could never lose weight on my program that for the first time did just from stopping restaurants. So, you know, again, people listen, this isn't a court ordered um, thing, you know, you can choose your life. And you just have to understand that when you choose your behavior, you choose the consequence and what may sound like crazy to one person is completely doable for another. Because to me, the treat is not going to the restaurant, the treat is being able to be a woman in her 60s that can eat mass amounts of healthy food, maintain a lean weight after 50 years of failure. And that's the treat. So I don't want to jeopardize this. It's like when you're given a brand new car, like, why would you want to drive it through mud? You know, I mean, to me, restaurants are just a punishment. And, you know, I, I have a really wonderful life without having to go to restaurants. I know my parents would, would say to me, you know, that when I was a kid and even when they were kids, going out to eat was like a specialty. It was like a special thing. Once a year for your parents' anniversary. That's what I remember. Now we do it every meal. I know yeah. it got to the point where when I was at my worst, every single meal was practically going out and it was driven by what do I feel like having? What craving is calling my name now? And that's this is where we've gotten to. And is it any shock that so many people are overweight and sick. Yeah, I, I blame, well, I don't want to say I blame the restaurant industry. I blame the processed food industry and really what is restaurants for the most part. And, you know, healthy restaurants will not survive there. I mean, there may be a couple in the world. There's uh, Casa de Luz in, it's in Texas. I don't know what, I can't think of what, Austin, I think. And there's uh, um, Green Fair Cafe in, in Herndon, Virginia. But for the most part, every healthy type restaurant that I saw established failed because, because people are looking to get high from eating. They're not looking to life. They're not looking for life for pleasure. They, they want to get their fix. And, you know, I remember one called Gratis that was on San Vicente. Gratis means free. And it basically was a fat-free restaurant. It wasn't vegan, but they had, you know, guacamole made a piece and it, and it crumbled. And there was another one called Local Nocal. Anytime there was something like that, because people want high fat, high calorie food. They, they want to be stimulated and they want to, you know, get your dopamine somewhere else, do some exercise, do some volunteer work, find ways to feel good in your brain that don't just involve eating. It's, right. it's, it's really the, the, the mass addiction of, of the world. Right. Would, would you say that having something like an instant pot would be a great tool to have that you can make a lot of stuff with it, you know, I to save know. you from going out? I don't know how people live before the instant pot. It's funny, you know, it's like, there's, how did people live before cell phones? But, but we did. Instant pot just makes it easier to get healthy or it could be unhealthy food too, but it makes easier to get food prepped much more quickly. So things that would take an hour, say like steel cut oats would take five minutes and artichokes, which could take an hour of boiling on the stove, take about seven minutes. And for, you know, for five to 10 minutes, I can make soups, stews, chilies, and I can batch cook. That's really, you know, the secret. You got to batch cook. You got to find some kind of batch cooking system so that healthy food is the default and that it's always you know, always available. And Instant Pot makes it so much easier to do that. Yeah. Like if you're going to make a rice dish, let's say, how can we flavor rice to make it taste good? That's not, you know, the typical bland rice. I love rice. You know, rice. And without me, just adding salt either, because well, I know that you're not a big fan of just adding salt. No, I don't like, I don't, I don't, I think it's a lazy way to season and it makes my fingers swell. And plus, you know, salt is an appetite stimulant. A lot of people don't realize that, that the more you eat salt, the more you then crave sweet and it just makes you eat more food. So, but what I, I mean, there's so many ways to, to flavor food, but one of the things I love green onions, like to me, just taking rice, especially, and I love white rice. I cannot lie. I just take the green part of the onion and, and I mix it with the rice. It's delicious, but there's so many herbs and spices you can use that, that people can, can use a sumac is one of my favorite seasonings lately and it gives things not a salty flavor but almost a, a like a delightful sour flavor where you don't miss the salt so you can in the water when you cook the rice you can have flavored things you know you can put spices in there so yeah i mean you can use california balsamic vinegar i put i put the teriyaki vinegar on there and it tastes like soy sauce to me yeah and i'm glad that you said white rice because that gets a really bad rap um, yeah. There's a lot to learn from what Walter Kempner did with the rice diet. That's oh that God. is a major thing. But and it's because he didn't that would not have worked if he was mixing it with oil or fat. 
people would have put on weight, you know? And the fact that he, he had rice, it was by itself. But when we add things like broccoli or onions and carrots and everything, it's very, very healthy. Um, it's delicious. I eat rice all the time. I love it. I mean, I, it's, you know, I'm going to actually, I do a daily show on YouTube. Maybe you come on sometime and tell your story, but I have a couple of ladies coming on that actually did the rice diet for years and lost like hundreds of pounds doing it. I haven't met somebody like that yet. And, you know, he also gave his, his patients sugar and fruit juice. Right. And, they still not only lost weight, but reversed their diabetes. And so right. like earlier when you said, well, the potato turns to insulin, well, I guess the rice does too, but tell that to Walter Kepner, people should really look up his work. Yeah. Cause he put them on things that we would say, well, what are you trying to kill them? You know, giving them fruit juice and white rice. Like this is the stuff that we associate. This is how bad that things have gotten where we associate bad things with these foods, but it's really what we eat them with that changes everything. Absolutely. Well, before I let you go, I, there's one thing I've been wanting to ask you. So I want to take a trip back to 1987. I was a freshman in college and you were on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Oh my God, and September I, 1st. I know yes. I, that was like the hot, I gosh, that was one of the highlights of my life. He, you know, I watched him from the age of seven that I remember, you know, so for 20 years, I would just dream like, God, I'd love to meet him. I'd love to be on his show. And that was just magical. He, he was such a consummate entertainer, gentleman, professional. I got, got to tell you, I smile. I got to be on the Carson podcast. I smile every time I think of him. We learned a lot about you during that episode. <laughs> <laughs> that was, and you can see I really was heavy, you know? I mean, shockingly, I was. And I also had a bad haircut. And too. you were vegan for 10 I or so vegan. years. I had already been vegan for 10 years, which is, you know, I try to get, listen, people are going to do what they're going to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to save people some pain and suffering by not going down the same path that I did with the junk food veganism. I mean, it's great for the animals and better for the environment, but if your goal is health and weight loss, you got to eat real food and real food comes from plants like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And if you can afford them calorically, nuts, seeds, and avocado. Definitely. That's a great way to end. And before we do, I want to promote whatever you've got going on. I know that you've got a brand new book. That's an yeah, update I got, of a book. I got an update of a book. So I got a brand new book, but if people are really like wanting to know more about weight loss and food addiction, I don't have it right here. The secrets to ultimate weight loss would probably be the one I recommend, although this does have beautiful pictures. And what I've been doing since the pandemic began is I do a daily show on YouTube at 11 a.m. Pacific time every day. It's about an hour show and it's an interview show. We often have doctors giving PowerPoints or chefs making recipes and people can connect with me there in the live chat. It, it streams on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, but I prefer YouTube is it, where people watch if they can, because we have this nice little chat. And yeah, that's that's what I do. Seems like every time I'm on Facebook, you're always live. Like, I don't know when you sleep, but- uh... <laughs> No, I sleep good at night, but yeah. It, it, well, there was a couple of times I was doing like, well, because people say, I have a book, can I get out? So I've been going sometimes up to five times a day, but my preferred is to just do one show a day if possible. And so what's your website? My name, chefaj.com. Okay. That sounds good. Chef AJ, thank you so much for coming on and we'll do it again, I hope, because there's more that we could talk about, but uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you so much, Anthony.